Thanks for, uh, for being here today, the first in um, Singapore Meet Magento. It's good to be here. Um, it's also first for us. We are uh, just expanded into Asia, uh, literally this week. Uh, we expanded into Europe uh, four or five months ago from uh, our US office. And we opened up our office here in, in Singapore. So it's, it's very good. And as we were doing that, I immediately realized it's very easy nowadays to open up an office. You get a payroll company, you get somebody in WeWork, and boom, you're done. You're inside another country. It's that simple. But still, there's a lot of other stuff that you have to take care of. And we're going to look at that today. Uh, we learned a lot through talking to our merchants. Um, merchants that typically work with us uh, are in multiple countries. Uh, and they are sometimes in 50, 60 plus countries, and uh, they have to deal with all the pains and all the problems that they basically have with, uh, with expanding. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've lived and worked in US, in Japan, in uh, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and also in the Netherlands, uh, which is actually where I'm from. Um, so I've firsthand experienced how it is to be a consumer, but also to be professional in, in, in payments, mostly, uh, of my life. And um, yeah, what you see, and I think also was earlier brought up in, in PayPal as well, you see that you get a different perspective on a lot of things that, that happen in the space. And every country has different payment methods. Every country has different uh, cultural aspects that we're going to look at. Um, so today, well, e-commerce is growing. That is a fact, I think. But still, I'm putting it out there because there's some real estate um, development managers in China that say, well, you know, that e-commerce thing, ah, that should be over by, you know, maybe a few years from now. And, you know, we've had it. People still want to touch products. But we are in the best place in the world, as was said before. This is Asia. It's growing the fastest. There's no uh, a place in the world where it's growing faster uh, at this moment than in Asia. But it's also one of the harshest environments. And by harsh, I don't mean the outback in Australia or uh, Tibetan um, uh, level somewhere high up in the 1600 altitude, 16,000 altitude, uh, that, that probably is even. Um, I'm talking about the fact that in the US, we have one language. There's basically sort of a homogeneous group of people. They all look the same. They all talk the same. They all have the same currency. There's no borders, nothing there. We have, in Asia, we have islands. We have different currencies. We have different languages, different cultures, a lot of things that make it a lot harder. In Europe, at least, we have one currency pretty much still. You know, and in Africa, there's one big land mass. In South America, you have two languages, pretty much one language for the most of it. But in Asia, everything is, is, is hard. And just discussing with uh, some, some, some fellow payment people, you know, if you look at this, for every country, you have to build different connections. For every country, there's some sort of different payment method that you have to integrate. And that makes it a little bit extra hard. Um, so today, we're going to uh, look at um, four regions, uh, specifically India, China, Japan, and Australia. We could have picked Korea, uh, I realized later, but we looked a little bit at the proximity of uh, the uh, countries also to um, uh, Singapore, and also to see, like, these are really different areas, right? Every country has its own uniqueness in uh, how to approach it. Um, now, we're going to look at a few parts. We're going to look at the growth of the market. How is it growing? What's growing? What should you look at when you, um, when you assess these markets? We're going to also look at the mobile landscape. And believe it or not, I mean, we could say, yeah, mobile is growing. Everybody's on the mobile. But there's some nuances to every single of these countries that you have to take into account when you, when you look at them. Um, then there's the payment landscape, um, also vastly different between all of these countries, um, uh, logistics, and finally, a marketing message. And there we share some best practices and things we've uncovered in talking to our merchants, but also doing some research on these uh, countries. Now, first of all, what I started with as a previous academic, uh, and also from Holland, Hofstede, he used to work at Philips. He did a very large-scale research to see what's the difference between all these countries on a various amounts of things. Like, you got power distance, individualism, uh, you got uncertainty avoidance, uh, long-term orientation, and you can see already that there's a big difference between these, these countries. For instance, 
I always liked Japan. I used to live there for a little while. And when I went there, just before that, I read an article, Dutch versus Japanese people are almost like this. On every level, there's the Dutch are here, and the Japanese are there, and, and vice versa. Now, you think that that might, might make it hard for these people to do business, but they were one of the few, actually, that did really successful business very early in the day. And that was because the Dutch didn't want to impose the religion on the Japanese. So they allowed the Japanese just to perform their own religions, their own cultures. They just wanted to do trade, just simple business, very plain and simple. And that's why the Japanese allowed them to have you know, a trade port in, inside, Jap inside Japan. Um, and I figured out that too, that is if you respect the culture, if you think about you know, the culture that you're working with, and you take even these type of things into account before you enter a country, and already helps you. And these are really simple things. You go to Hofstede-Insights, uh, uh, and you can pretty much plot in every country that you want to go. And it's, it just gives you a sort of, sort of frame of mind. What type of companies, what type of people am I dealing with if I go into this country? And it's, it's going to be different. And it's going to be sometimes really opposite of how your culture is that you're from. If you, for instance, look at um, uncertainty and avoidance, here, I think that's a quite a nice one. Long-term orientation, you know, you see there's a very big difference. Even on certain the avoidance, if you look at the Singaporean uh, rate, that was almost to the bottom. It's like like eight or something like that. And in, in this case, Japan is almost at, the, at 92. Um, so first, India. I asked, asked two of my Indian colleagues to prepare something, so to give a little bit of a context of what's different, uh, and what's, what's sort of like, you know, unique about India. And one of the things, uh, immediately, if I look at India, I, I see this. I see, like, it's actually a pretty small market. It's not really big. E-commerce in India, it's, it's, it's actually quite tiny. Compared to all the other markets, Korea, Japan, United States, China. But the potential is huge. And everybody recognizes that. Everybody knows that there is a lot of, lot of untapped potential in India that, that can just explode over the few years. People say India right now is about sort of six years, seven years behind China, and there is a huge mass of people that are just waiting to go online, and as soon as that happens, it's going to grow, and it's going to explode. But how, you know, how, how, do you do that? how do you deal with that? I mean, that's a, a, tough, a tough question. And do you go now? Do you wait? I mean, but it's in, in, important to understand that this type of market dynamics in, exists there, that you can at some point see this hyper growth going there. Other countries, maybe to a lesser extent, but India specifically has, you know, it's almost the same market size as a country as Holland, or it's smaller even than Australia, but Australia has a lot um, less people there. Now, if you look at the mobile landscape, you still see, uh, again, a lot of people use the internet for their uh, just day-to-day -day business on their mobile. They're not buying yet on mobiles, but they're using the internet on mobiles, which is quite a different, uh, it's a different thing. And a lot of them are still using feature phones. And that's a, quite a high percentage. You'll see that later on in Japan as well, also there. You know, this is, can go up to, you know, depending on the, the sources that you read, up to the 40% of feature phones. And why would people use feature phones? Well, it's, it's because data plans are expensive, because, for instance, uh, the data bandwidth is not really yet to a certain level in some, some areas. And what you also see is that social media is widely used. People use uh, their, their mobile phones, but not yet for apps. So it's, it's sort of recommendable if you were thinking about going with an app or going app-based into uh, India, it's better to do an e-commerce-enabled, like, optimized site and not, not an app-based optimized site. Now, in terms of payments, um, be, because you know online commerce is not that familiar yet, you know on uh, on mobile, uh, you also see that payments are not yet fully optimized on on mobile in, in India. So they are a little bit lagging, and even in Australia, that's still the case. Um, however, you see that cash and delivery is quite popular. Um, people moved away from uh, cash and delivery recently to card on delivery, which is I think a great brainstorm that we can just keep the C on there and just call it card on delivery. And in fact, it's still the same terrible payment method because you can ship a product all the way to the outskirts of some rural area, and then you know the person is not home, he doesn't accept the product, 
it gets sent back. Now, th that's the, another problem there, which if he sends that back, it might get lost, if you know what I mean, right? So somebody you know, is piling up some really expensive products, and it never makes it back to your, uh, to your shipping facility. And that's another thing, right? If you look at, uh, we'll look at uh, logistics a little bit better. If you have local shipping um, um, partners, they can help you with that. They can help you to get as also the returns flow a little bit better, and, and it, it saves you a lot of uh, lost goods over time. Um, and the third thing is this sort of wallets. It's very popular nowadays. Of course, we've been also hearing about it from PayPal earlier in the morning. Um, you got some local wallets in, um, in Asia. When there was a demon demonetization uh, all overnight, you know, a lot of money went up in flames. <laughs> Nobody knows where it went. But some of the wallets really benefited from that, and uh, they got a huge market share right now. Uh, so it's, it's, it's recommendable to also offer those type of uh, methods uh, to consumers. And you see something like online banking. It's also uh, something that's promoted. And the government in India has been quite supportive of e-commerce. They launched quite a few uh, programs to support it. Uh, if you want to tap into that, uh, even as foreign companies, to some extent, it's possible. I mean, they will still favor, uh, of course, local startups to, to thrive and local startups to take advantage of that. But it's unlike China, there is some sort of more like an interaction with uh, foreign companies. Uh, well, if you look at India as one of the countries where you see there's less urbanization than in um, other places like Australia or, or where we are here, it's, it's, it's only urbanization actually. Um, and you see that also that extra rural traffic, uh, it, it makes it a little bit harder to, uh, to work in, uh, in India. And it's, it's, it's recommendable to have local partners for your logistics. But you can very well sort of grow into that uh, a little bit later and maybe work with the marketplace and then la let the marketplace take care of the logistics. Um, now, I'm just curious here, out of everybody in, in, in the room, who is currently delivering or working with merchants in India? You guys. So, I mean, just, just curious, what, what type of, have you seen some of these problems with, uh, with returns or with uh, COD or anything like that? Yeah. And what else, what else would you see, say is like a learning that you had from, from uh, So I'm just going to say, sort of, I'm going to just roughly translate it in the way, sort of, so every, I'm not going to translate you. I'm going to just, just lay it out here. Is that, um, yes, the marketplaces are very uh, important. There is a large uh, area that to cover, and also languages is a very thing, important uh, part to cover. I mean, we're, we're not in the same plot here, but, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is what I was going to say. There are actually 22 languages, official languages in, in India, and there are way more dialects and way more other things. And if you, if you look at it, a lot of people say like, okay, English and Hindi, then I'm covered. But it's not the case. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't speak English, English and Hindi, so you still have a pretty big portion of the uh, population that you're not covered. And also from a region, there's a huge difference between the, the, the bottom and the top. And my colleagues both are from Delhi, so they're, you know, from that region, and they, they know all the customs of that region, but then there's regions in the north who have different customs. Now, I asked them, okay, what are the things that you can do to still run a marketing campaign inside India that does run sort of a national appeal? And the national appeal is somehow Bollywood and crickets and festivals. Every month or so, there's some sort of a festival that you can using your campaigns and you can, you know, win the emotions and win the sort of trust of the local population across the nation versus just a, a, a certain area. But it's still good to do some local regional marketing campaigns as well. Um, now, what is also important, of course, 
is, sorry, I'm already going to, 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 to China. What, what I just wanted to say about India as well, and what I've, what I've learned as well, is that the relationships with local um, partners is extremely important. I mean, having an integrator there with people on the, on the ground that help you to understand some of these things. And it's going to count for a lot of other countries, but especially also for India, for, for some regions. Now, on China, um, of course, that's the big, big animal in the room. Everybody you know, either loves China, hates China, doesn't touch China, wants to go to China. And I, I, have a hard, I had a hard problem for a long time with, with China because a lot of the merchants that I worked with, they didn't want to go there because they were saying, like, they're copying everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can't win there. And they went into China and they went back. But it's, it's, it has still the huge potential. And if you're there, if you do it right, you can still win big. Um, one of the things, of course, if you sell a fill-in product here to every uh, Chinese person, you can become a millionaire. I mean, that sort of doesn't really work like that, but it's still in the minds of a lot of people that if you at least could sell one thing to one of these uh, you know, billion of uh, customers, then you could, could um, become very successful. The problem is you first have to get in. And that's a problematic thing, right? So everybody knows about the great Chinese firewall um, it's a tough uh, thing to crack. Uh, there's a lot about, I think I read there's 18,000 websites blocked. There must be probably more, but that's uh, at least one of the numbers that, that will spit out of the internet. Um, and you need licenses, you need commercial ICP, uh, you need to apply for that, you need to have entities. Uh, if you would uh, decide to, for instance, use hosting outside of um, China, you maybe choose Hong Kong for that, uh, but still you run the risk that they would find out and then you have to apply for a license anyway if you take your side of line and there's a lot of these things and you know, you can also work together with a Chinese local partner, of course. Um, so what are, what are the things that we, we saw is that a lot of these merchants that go into China, they work with uh, uh, local uh, Chinese partners with, uh, with the marketplaces first. Uh, they have local logistics partners as well to, uh, to work with them. Um, because they work with them, they can also tap into local uh, Jap uh, Chinese uh, payment methods. And if you look at Chinese payment methods, it's very clear. Alipay, uh, WeChat Pay, they dominate. Um, you can, of course, do Chinese Union Pay as well. There's a few other payment methods as well. Who, who else is here in... China, who's selling into China or has a merchant selling into China? You? So tell me about it. You're from, from China, from Shanghai, right, TMO, I think? Good, okay, I knew that. Um, so tell me, what, what, what have you experienced with, with merchants coming into China and, and working uh, sort of the market there? Uh, China market is big enough, but still uh, very, very different from the rest of the world. So uh, apart from uh, like uh, um, entity, uh, how you uh, adapt to the China, China law, but still on the implementation side, there are a lot of difference. So when it comes to uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, like a uh, different pet, even for Alipay, they will have uh, Alipay desktop, Alipay mobile, Alipay cross-border. So three payment gateway already. And they, yeah, for Chinese uh, consumer, they are also very um, spoiled. So um, like a pending payments, everything. Um, I think these days uh, also um, uh, marketplaces is not only the one touch point. Um, these days, um, like brand, brand e-commerce are getting picking up because for a lot of uh, brands, they are realizing actually um, it's the right time to collecting the, uh, the user data. So in China, mainly our work with uh, multi-channeling. So uh, connecting data from a marketplace like a Jingdong, Timo, and also from their own uh, brand e-commerce, at the same time also working on social media, for example, WeChat e-commerce and other social media uh, windows like uh, Toutiao or Douyin, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, quite a lot of difference. 
Yeah. So Good. Actually, it, it seems like I've just randomly put people in here to sort of say things that I'm going to touch upon later, but it's not the case. Um, no, it's, 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 it is, it's like that. And, and just sort of in the middle, I just wanted to touch upon the logistical landscape. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. A lot of the uh, Alipays and uh, Tencents, they are investing heavily into logistics and building up their own logistical channels. So if you would tap into those channels, it would mean for you that you really get that like last mile delivery done well. And um, you could also try to do it yourself. You can even start with, uh, with just the basic UPS and the FedEx and those kind of things. But at some point, it does make sense sort of to tap into the ones that really know how to do this and how to deliver like billions of packages each year to the right people. And a lot of Chinese people are literally like ordering 20 times a month. I mean, they're just on their phone, they're ordering every day, and they're looking at like small, small products, really small things, but they make sure that at the end of the day, they sort of go through what they've put in their basket and then do order that stuff and then take it out. But it's, it's like almost like shopping in a real shop, and throughout the day, they just decide sort of what they want to uh, keep and what they don't want to keep. Um, you said it, it's sometimes the small language errors that this is a Pepsi uh, campaign that went horribly wrong. It's come alive with Pepsi, but then uh, the translation was Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. Not entirely the same thing as the original intended uh, campaign. And yeah, to your point, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a lot of countries, uh, and especially in China, of course, with, with, the, with the science and with the the meaning of certain words, um, you really have to make sure that it's, it's not machine translated or anything, that it's really well thought through that it exactly means what it is. So just the basic translator even sometimes doesn't cut it. You need to really have somebody that just thinks about sort of the small nuances of this language. Um, and there's like thousands of hundreds, hundreds, maybe even thousands of dialects that you have to look into. Um, we all know the, the huge numbers about all these shopping holidays. Of course, that's something that you have to take care of. But if you ever plan a launch or plan something and you launch your brand site, uh, that you can also offer something during the shopping holidays. Um, and still, Alibaba and JD uh, are dominating this, this, this marketing landscape with like billions of, um, of, of advertising spend that's, that's created and that's ever, ever increasing. Um, WeChat is huge. Weibo is also, I think, uh, a good second contender. It's not as, as great, of course. Of not as, as it's, it's a good, good tool, but WeChat by far dominates. So that's something I think we also talked about during the conference. Is, you know, people say, like, okay, we got uh, a good integration with, um, with WeChat. That's why we, we help customers do well. And at least that part of the, of the corporation is, is, is taken care of. Um, so um, fourth, third market is Australia. Um, it's, a, it's a slightly smaller market than uh, the other ones, but it's still yeah, just bigger than, than, uh, than India at this, at this point. But it's not growing as fast as, as India. Um, what you do see is that Australian people are quite active uh, compared to sort of other, play, other companies, especially of countries, especially in Europe. They do regular orders, so they are regularly placing orders. It's a little bit more competitive market because it's easy to enter. It's English. It's uh, westernized. It's a first port of call for the US or for, U for UK if they want to uh, expand into the rest of the world. Um, and mobile, strangely enough, it's, um, it's very well penetrated, but it's not yet you know, widely, widely used for, for e-commerce. And one of the reasons could be, for instance, that many of these sites, apparently 50%, are not re yet mobile optimized. A lot of big forms, payment methods, not optimized for mobile yet. So that's something to take care of. That also, if you look at it, they can really win big if you make sure that you have that, you know, head start across somebody that has this handicap of still having their own site there. Um, and yeah, some of the areas, it's not the, sort of the best, the fastest internet in the world. We'll also talk about that, about broadband in, in Australia. So take care of that, that the, the responsiveness and the, the, the load times of your site. Um, for payments, I mean, you see your general credit debit cards, 
there are some new payment methods that are rising, uh, like uh, afterpay, uh, zip money, like postpay uh, methods that you, know, you first get your product and then afterwards you have to pay it. And uh, you just basically check out based on, on your identity. And you also see that the banks push like real-time um, banking methods. And that's sort of, hopefully, at, maybe at some point, sort of uh, pushing out the, the credit card uh, companies out of, uh, out of the checkout. Um, and then logistics. The funny thing there is that you think a country that big uh, must have some problems with logistics. It's not that bad, actually. So they got a uh, very good uh, score on a sort of global ranking of uh, how their logistics performs. And they see that there's just a few big cities, actually. So if you have those cities covered, you will have about 8% are really of the population is in rural areas. But you don't have a, a lot of problems with that because logistics generally is good. However, the broadband is, is quite slow. So if you think about that, when you have your site and the site doesn't perform that well, it could be because the broadband on average has like 25 megs, whereas in Singapore you have 160. And it's even worse than a country like Kazakhstan, for instance. It's, it's ranked somewhere around, around the 50s and the 60s on the ranking of the world as slowest, uh, of, as fastest uh, internet, but then it's quite slow if you rank around that number. Um, and marketing, um, yeah, content marketing is quite important. People love content. They love in-person events. So most of the uh, marketing campaigns evolve, uh, evolve around uh, in-person events. Um, there's quite a lot of money lost to, to ad fraud, uh, something that you know we speak to our customers about. We, we protect customers around uh, against uh, order fraud, but also against advertising fraud. And uh, one other thing we've just figured out is that, you know, despite it being, it, it is an English market, but you do need still to have this sort of local Australian uh, feel. Um, and then we got Japan. It's a huge market, top four, top five of the world. Uh, but many people really don't uh, look at Japan because it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, and you see that a lot of people say, well, it's just 5% of the market is e-commerce. But you can turn it around and say, like, only 5% of it is e-commerce. So it's, it has a lot of potential. Um, everybody's on a mobile. I think that's no surprise there. Uh, people are, uh, I think, six hours, seven hours a day on the mobile. And um, if you see that debit cards, credit cards is very popular, you also have uh, convenience payments. Cash, cash is still very popular in, uh, in Japan. And you have your um, payment after delivery, which is uh, rising very significantly. So that's again taken over. It, it's a, sort of a global trend that you know, these tools, they resemble credit cards a little bit more, and they uh, behave more like credit cards. So you get an instant confirmation as a merchant that you, know, you can ship the goods safely, and that the payment after delivery company takes the risk. Um, relationships are important. Japanese like packaging things on time. That's just not a, a secret, obviously, but it's, it's uh, something that you have to take into account that when you go there that you can deliver that quality. And in terms of marketing, um, it's one language. It makes it easy to communicate in, uh, in Japanese. Uh, and strangely enough, when I came there myself, I saw like pages almost look like books, like a lot of text. But that's normal. So just, you know, Japanese care about having a lot of information. They, they love it. Um, and there's one of the high, highest number of ad fraud, so it runs advertising fraud, which is if people click uh, on, their, uh, on your advertising just to sort of make it cost money for you. Um, there's click farms and bots and those kind of things. It's about 80% ad fraud. So you can really reduce your ad fraud if you uh, uh, protect yourself against that. Um, and finally, yeah, you've got Line, which is the most used um, tool in, um, in, in Japan. Everybody basically uses that. So just sort of wrapping up, I mean, uh, think about your cultural differences. I think that's an important one. Um, you have uh, markets that are all growing fast, so just grab on, hold on, and, and just go with the uh, with the fast-growing market. Um, if you have sort of channels that you want to uh, uh, pick, uh, you want to uh, attack these channels, 
There's so many apps that help you to get into the, the local malls, to get, help you to get into um, local uh, chat functions or anything like WeChat related. And there's, there's a lot of system integrators that help you integrate them. And um, when you have payment methods that you can pick, try to pick them immediately from the start because then you'll get the benefit of having them. Um, and if the logistics plan that you cannot start with, you know, you can start with is not the ideal one, it doesn't matter, but have something in mind where you can involve into. And uh, once you have sort of local resources, have these, you know, local resources, really use them to, to, to define your local campaigns. Now, a little bit about sort of us, just to give you a context of how we, we deal with this every day. Um, you know, merchants have a lot of their plates, integrators too. Uh, we deal with, um, uh, fraud, with advertiser fraud, with performance, uh, with order fraud. And what we do is we basically developed a tool that tracks the user behavior with the JavaScript snippet throughout his customer lifecycle. And he s looks at what is the customer doing. So before the checkout is even reached, we have a fairly good idea whether a customer is a bot, whether the customer is a fraudster, whether the customer has good intentions, bad intentions with that transaction. And we can say, listen, stop this transaction or perform some extra checks or you know, kill this campaign or something like that. And we also give out alerts. You can set rules. You can flag orders. You can uh, kill campaigns. And this is all just one-click installation, one-click application on a Magento uh, plugin. So this is what we do. Hopefully, you know, it, it works for somebody else. Uh, if you have a lot of headache on market entry, you know, at least one pain can be taken away, which is sort of fraud and uh, advertising. Uh, fraud. So yeah, that's it. If you have any further questions, come to visit us on our booth. Uh, if you have any specific questions around market entry, Japan or Australia or India, just uh, come and approach me and I'm sure we can sort of look up somebody in our team that uh, can specifically help you on that issue. Thank you.